captain for the Black Stars, ready to do battle. Every country has cycles. You have Ghana after the 82 Nations Cup, followed by the debacle of Boaké in 84 when the Black Stars visited. Then the Black Stars didn't show up over the period of 84 up to 92 when the Black Stars were back. Abedi Pele. In 92 returned to great effect. That's Abedi Pele. A shot and the ball is in the net. We're so much in love with Abedi Pele at the time. And the dream of very young supporter or every young boy playing who plays football in the streets of Accra would love to see the maestro plate and at the time you remember also that uh, we had one of the best striker on the continent in Anthony Yebwa who was doing so well in the German Bundesliga. Otto Fista had just won Ghana what was then its first major World Cup at any level. So when we saw that uh, the, the under 17 team that we had fallen in love some of the guys, Mohamed Gago, Lamte, Yalpreko and Co was promoted into the Black Stars. We just fell in love with the team. He needed something special to break the deadlock in the second half and we got it from the African Player of the Year, Abedi Pele. And that Nations Cup was really good. You know, we only lost by a marathon penalty when Tony Bafo missed in that, in that uh, shootout where every player played and then he had to start all over again. So 92 losing finalists, 94 quarter finalists in the most bizarre circumstances that expose deep cuts within the team. 96 semi-finalists, a lot of people thought we should have won. I thought we should have won. We were so confident we we're going to win that tournament because the team actually played very well. It was a tournament only for us to lose the match show in the quarterfinals against Zahir, what is now known as the DR Congo. That bad injury sustained um, from the Taco Arif, I remember very well from a defender called Tumu in Bele. He actually got the match out of the end. The moment Abedi left that tournament due to injury, we knew the end had come. I remember being in Pope's John Secondary School and the sense of almost a funeral when we lost that semi final to South Africa by three goals to nil and the sense of injustice. When we were going, we were ready to go on the third and we were singing. The South Africans were inside. We were singing, go, go, go. Then they came, when they came, no. They saw us and they started their days. I'm telling you, we lost the match there before we went there. <laughs> <laughs> then 98, when we thought, you know, this was our team that had peaked, we got a real shock in, in not being able to get the result that we would have wanted by getting knocked out in the first round. 2000, we co-hosted the tournament. And I think the 98 tournament was Abedi Ayu's last tournament. So he had gone off the scene at Tony Ibar has gone. The likes of Prince Poli and Co. had faded out. Then Sika Kono, who uh, at the time was now becoming a very important player in the team, took over the arms band. But the, the likes of Sam Johnson, the likes of Gago, Alex Nyakum, Augustine Ahimfo were all now in, a very integral member members of the Black Stars. And we're so confident when we co-hosted the tournament with Nigeria that we're going to go all the way. Again, we lost painfully, I think, in the quarterfinals to South Africa in Kumasi. Then 2002, uh, we had built a team off the back of the, of the under-21 World Cup losing finally. So you had Michael Essien, John Pencil, John Mensah. We were inexperienced. We were youngsters coming to the limelight. And myself, my first uh, assignment was in 2002, Cup of Nations in Mali. So we took that young team to Mali. We knew that it was a team that was undergoing a rebuild. So we're not expecting any sort of magic from them. They went past the group stage. You remember there was Kotoko Hadis player as in Boache. He eventually scored two quick goals in a game that we needed to win. I think it was against Burkina Faso. We needed to win to qualify. And then he rescued and took us to the quarterfinals only to be eliminated by Nigeria. Ghana was kicked out at the quarterfinal stage. 
we set up a committee, I remember the F school to find out why we didn't win the trophy. Every Afghan Ghana thinks that we are entitled to win. <laughs> Not even play the panel, but entitled to win. So 2004 was a bit like you were building on the progress. It was like you've built a new crop of players. The GF administration at the time, headed by Ben Kofi, who was at Abidi Pele as vice, had said that they wanted to build a team for the future. And at that particular time, I'll be honest with you, there was no motivation around the national team. Uh, no sponsorships, even the jerseys. We have to print the jerseys. And uh, no kids, man. Uh, players have to watch the jerseys when we're in camp. So it was so many, so many things. So for me, none of the players, even the seniors who were playing, were not willing to, to come and play. Due to Ghana's pedigree in, in football, we had attained a certain stature. And, uh, <laughs> excuse me to say, a certain sense of entitlement that we must qualify to every AFCON, that uh, our qualification to the AFCON was a matter of rights <laughs> and not a privilege. Then in 2004, we, we didn't qualify. We were in a group of three. We were three in the group and only one qualified. Ghana, Uganda and Rwanda. And Rwanda qualified. The first time ever in the history of the country. They qualified ahead of Ghana and, uh, and Uganda. That was one of the, the massive disappointment. As a fan of the Black Stars, I remember very well the mood of the country. We just couldn't accept. It was a very painful uh, experience for the country. If we had been kicked out by one of the soccer heavyweights, it probably would not make headlines. But being kicked out by Rwanda made it look like we were just uh, out of form, we didn't do well, and the whole country was very dissatisfied with that. We were also dissatisfied because Ghana had qualified for almost every AFCON, and our qualification was taken for granted. We were looking at winning AFCON, not qualified. For us, qualifying to AFCON is no news. It's not an achievement for Ghana to qualify to the AFCON. And I think that, again, the indecision on the part of the FA as to who should be the leader from the technical team cost the team because we had a very young team. All they needed was proper coaching and proper guidance. And so we had three coaches at the time. We had the likes of Ike Afrani, started it, then we went back for Bukasis and then ended up with what Rad Zomdek. At the end of the day, all these three technical brains, because maybe they were coaches of different philosophy, they just couldn't get their message across within a very short time to get a team to qualify. And rightfully so, because if you look at the way we did our things at the time, there was no way we could have. So rightfully so, we failed to qualify. And that was one of the massive disappointment of the people of this country in football. So it was a reminder to us to get things right, to be patient in team building. I think that was the most important thing. And it was a really depressing period. You know, the commentary, the anger, the sense that Ghana could not be at the Nations Cup punctured. But it proved to be like, I thought, a major, major turning point in our attitude to things, in our resolve to qualify for major tournaments. So we needed to sit back, re-strategize, re -strategize, go back to the drawing board, find out why we didn't qualify and what we could do to qualify to the next uh, uh, competition, uh, which was both the World Cup and then the AFCON. So that meant that we needed to get a new technical team right away, come up with our strategy for the next uh, competition. So I remember a conversation with then Vice President of the GFA, Dr. Kofi Amar, back then, and I said to him, Doc, we have to go to this World Cup. We just have to. Um, I have to be honest, the feeling then was pretty good. There was a lot of confidence. Getting to 2005, 2006, um, then motivation started coming because um, people started believing that uh, this is the team that uh, can qualify Ghana. That's our generation from 2001. Uh, that played in Argentina 2001, so. And this was purely because, look, at the time, the under-21 team that finished losing finalists in Argentina, none of us expected that. 
but the manner of their victory over Brazil in the in the in the quarters when John Pinsa scored the winning goal, the praise from Argentina, you had Derek Button, you had players who had showed they could progress. And then you had Derek and the rest go on to play in the Champions League. Michael Essien was building up nicely at and bubbling up nicely at Bastia and then to Lyon and then was beginning to make his way into the main guy. At that level you had people like Suleiman Tai who had quality as Samoajan had showed a bit of that. There was then your Matthew Amwa, Joe Tex Frimpon. There were in, in a lot of people's mind there was enough to be confident. There was unanimity of opinion from the entirety of the country that Ghana ought to qualify to the World Cup. We had never qualified to the World Cup. And so right from government, FA, the media, the public, the general citizenry, there was a certain uh, sense of urgency that we needed to do something different in order to qualify for the World Cup. So immediately the government of President Kufo set up a 16 or 17 member committee, World Cup planning committee, made up of accomplished and established administrators, distinguished media people, citizens, and what have you. But somehow, I think egos and some petty issues <laughs> prevented this committee from working. So it whittled down from a governing committee now to a, a GFA committee. So we, we quickly organized ourselves and put in place a management committee of the Black Stars. So a plan was uh, laid out to see how we could confront these opponents. The qualifiers against Somalia was taken by Rav Zumdek, uh, who had taken Kotoko on quite a journey to losing the Africa Cup final and all that. And as you said, Somalia was routine. The first match in power was against Burkina Faso in Ouagadougou. So it was a home and away basis and a league format in which the, the, the team that emerges top of the group qualifies automatically. My first call up was Burkina Faso away game uh, with Barreto. Um, but the problem was I wasn't called invited when I was in Russia. I was on holidays. And uh, the FA realized I'm, in, I'm on holidays and then they invited me to go to camp, which I felt uh, they should have done things properly because uh, uh, my team knows that I'm on holidays. If they see me featuring for a game, I don't think it will be, it will be good for me and then for the country as well. So uh, I, I was with the, with the team, but I did not travel with them to Burkina Faso. Yeah, um, I was part of uh, the team, but I think uh, I missed my flight. Uh, yes, and then I think my colleagues went. And yeah, I think building up to uh, such a game was a difficult one because we saw that Burkina was coming with fire. We may have started camp on a Saturday or so. After about, uh, the, the match was to be the next weekend. After about three camping days, there were only two or three players in camp. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the boys, the, we came to meet the old attitude, you know, so blessed we had invited, they would come down, the late Elijah Mekan, who was then the team manager, you'd be at the airport waiting for them, the player comes, joins family and friends, and then off they shoot off. First game in the qualifiers, and I remember travelling to Burkina Faso for that, we played pretty well, but we lost by a goal to nil. I remember that game wasn't shown live. So all that we could do was to follow the commentary. And if you listen to the way the commentary went on the game, it was clear that we were doing so well. But again, painfully, we lost that game by a goal. I remember Samiko 4 got injured. There was a moment where he had to bandage his arm, playing, just trying to die for this country. We knew that we had players who were then very committed to the cause because Ghana, historically, had never been to the Mondial. We had never been there. So, and we were questioning ourselves. We, we taught ourselves to be one of the powerhouses on the continent of Africa. And so, how, how come that it, that's taken us this long to be at a World Cup and to more or less um, destroy our immediate ambition? We lost the first game. And Ghanaians were, oh, there we go again. I'm not sure we are going to be there. There needed to be an awareness that this will not be a walk in the park. And the Burkina defeat provided that. 
he alerted everybody to what had to be done. He alerted everybody to the agency. He alerted government to the need to provide more money. He alerted the players to look, this is something you can do. We really battled Burkina uh, in that stadium for a very, very long time in Ouagadougou. And when they scored, we were all crest falling. The flight back was painful. But there was, there was, there was, there was a, lot of, a lot of confidence that was taken from there. I must point out that we enjoyed the full support of the government because that was the first time that Black Star um, per diem had been increased from $50 to $100. Bonuses had also been increased from $1,000 to $2,000. Fortunately for us, we had Gold First Ghana coming on as a sponsor and uh, we used the sponsorship money to top up the bonuses. So bonuses were hiked from 2000 the government approved rate of 2000 to $3,000, yes. And then we were just increasing the bonuses as a way of motivating the players. That is not to say that money was the only motivation. Yeah. We engaged players, we discussed every plan we had with the players, and the players were very, very committed. You know, President Kufo is a, is a football person, and he was very much the father of the team. There were a number of times when they spoke to the team through the minister's phone and then we were using these uh, some speakers and we were our own kind of way. At that time, they, we didn't have that much of this uh, video technology and things like that. But there were a number of times he called through the minister's phone or some of the players' phone and spoke to the players and encouraged the team. Afterwards, there was just these factors then that began to come together. But I remember running commentary in a lot of the games and with every game the crowd began to go up step by step and at some point by the time we played the day we played South Africa there was a full stadium in Kumasi. The South Africans came uh, with that history behind them thinking that uh, it was business as usual they were coming to beat us. <laughs> we started that competition with Mareno Barreto and then he won that game against South Africa 3-0 I remember Suleiman Tari scored a blazer, some, a non-drop blazer, bang into the back of that, set the tone. Seven was outstanding. It was an exemplary performance. They were playing the national anthem. Wicked mood activated. <laughs> I mean, it's time for business and losing against Burkina Faso in our first game. Playing against South Africa, who we have never beaten in, in a match, so yeah. I took it serious. And when it's time for business, there's no need to smile. And you see, being the captain, when the national uh, anthem is played, I mean, you feel honored. I mean, we have 30 plus population. So if you are part of that particular team, you have to be happy. But when it's business, it's business. You don't need to smile. Yeah, once a leader, always a leader. Because um, he took the game to the South Africans and he also took the game to we, his teammates, and he spoke to us as a leader, great one. And a, a captain that will lead by example. Because if you see your captain working hard, definitely you will also join. That was the game that uh, pushed us through. Because we're looking at South Africans, the, the history they had, and uh, how they play their game, they have everything at that time. When we were chasing for sponsors, for jerseys, they were already made, have the Adidas, the trash suit one. When you see their uniform, it will, it will even uh, put you down because you look at yourself, what you are wearing, and then what South Africans are wearing is, was huge different. different. Yeah. And, but beating them uh, gives us that opportunity, that uh, vim, that uh, confidence going forward thinking that, okay, definitely, beating South Africa here, definitely we'll get them over there. I, I think the, the main moment was the South Africa 3 0 because you go and lose to Burkina Faso, all right? You, and you want your, your campaign to get back on track as quickly as you can. And that 3 0 victory, look, Stephen Appiah was, I think, it was the single best performance I've seen of a Ghana captain in a long time. Second, maybe to Abidi Pele in that semi-final against Nigeria. Essien was in his element, Montari. You know, these were players who were playing with hats. There had been a bit of rain. The pitch was rough. 
she had backstabbed the South Africa coach was so angry. I remember going to him and asking him first question, how do you feel? He said, that's a stupid question. How else do you expect me to feel? They were furious. And you could tell in their body language. For me, that was the moment Ghana realized that, look, this is doable. They justified the choice of Kumasi as the venue for our matches. And we played the rest of the matches there. In fact, it started in 2004 during the qualifications for the Olympic Games, 2003-2004, when we were winning. And, and so in football, you don't change your winning team. So you don't also change your winning venue. <laughs> The third game away at Uganda. We knew that the Ugandans had been a thorn in our flesh, historically. But if you look at the belief of our team, we knew we could go there and win. But we went there, we didn't lose, but we saw that 1-1 one -one result as a very positive one. If you listen to the players, they realized that the moment we didn't get beat in Uganda, they knew that if we can win all our home games and go and win one away game, will be in for the kill. And once we didn't lose that game against Uganda, our campaign was properly now on track. Then we came to play Kibet, we beat them 2-0. In that Kibet game, we didn't know Kibet at that time. Uh, even the records were telling us at that time there were 5,000 population. And you see, when it comes to football, population doesn't matter. Because what matters is you having your best 11, so coming to us, we didn't know much about them, no videos to watch them, to see where we can hurt them, their weak links, we didn't know. But when you play against teams who don't have any history, it was very difficult. That's why that game was a bit sloppy. And Ghanaians thought, oh, okay, the team is going down, they need to sit up and all that. Yeah, we're not, hap we're not happy with the performance. No two ways about it, because at the time, we felt that the likes of Stephen Apia, John Manson, Lai Kingston, Suleiman Tari, Michaelson had gone through the ones. And these are boys who knew themselves from the other 20 level. So they had proper chemistry. So we like to enjoy our football. For as long as we demand that our team go out there and win, we also will not compromise on the quality of our football. We want, and look who, were, who was in town, Kived. Minos, a, a, a team that we, we are expected to beat home and away and dominate and beat. Yes, we won the game 2-0, but Ghanaians were not happy. So, and then Marino Beretto showed a, 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 what I tend to be impatient. He, he, he just will not accept any form of critique. Marino Barreto, ah, hmm, another character. He was a good coach, but he didn't have the temperament to manage the off the pitch issues. He was easily persuaded by media distractions, excuse me to say, commentaries that were unfavorable to him. Uh, there were criticisms, even at the stadium, booze, that the team won. However, they were not satisfied with the performance. So the issue then was, were we interested in winning or displaying sweet football, regardless of the outcome? Who were interested in the outcome? Barreto couldn't take it, he left. He left. He did not tell us he was leaving. He left. The next time we read, he was with Maritimo, a team in Portugal. He had signed to coach Maritimo. I, I was sleeping at the time. When I woke up, I was told that he's gone. He just lifted his bag, got into the airport, and then he's going. said all sorts of things. But of course, that's him. Well, we just heard the news. Uh, sometimes, in the beginning, we were thinking, oh, speculations, you know, sometimes. But yeah, indeed, it was true that uh, he left. But yeah, we were just uh, playing buddies and then we taking slashings and we on our calls. So yeah, we, at that time, have to put it back of us and then look forward. So we, we reported him to FIFA and sued him for $10 million compensation, you know. He was ultimately found guilty, but the amount was, uh, I think, a bit excessive. But Barreto disappointed us. We were very, very, very disappointed. That left a huge vacuum which needed to be filled. Who was going to take over and continue the winning streak that the team had started? And we had one last group match to play before the end of the first round. So, Coach Samade stood in as a standing coach. Because somebody, yes, accepted like an uh, um, interim coach. He said, look, I'll do this because this is my country. But in the long term, you need to get somebody. In the past, 
decade and a half. I think that was the most difficult game we had played or we have ever seen the Black Stars played at Kumasi. Oh, it was a difficult match. We nearly lost the match, seriously. The Congolese came here, they wouldn't budge, they wouldn't allow us to even put even a goal past them. I remember last minute, there was a very uh, nimble-footed striker in that team who was brought down by one of our defenders in the very last minute. Uh, we were lucky not to concede a penalty. Yeah. There was a day I spoke to Steven Apia on this matter and he was like, look coach, after we drew that game against Congo, that was one of our worst days in the camp of the Black Stars. We were so confident that we needed to win. And when we drew that game, the players started asking themselves the same question. Are we going to fail to qualify for the World Cup again? Then the second round, we brought Dukovic. Before our second round of games, when uh, we, we, Dukovic came around, we had to organize a retreat. The management, all the, the entire management committee, the Tenga committee, including the head coaches and rest. Then we went to uh, what do you call the NDFA leadership at Dodua. We started the meeting, I think, around 5 or 6 p.m., no, 4 or 5 p.m. We ended at about 2 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a lot of sacrifice. Thinking through every step of the way, you know, March 1, March 2, blah, 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 blah. I think they're arguing, they're discussing things among ourselves. So at the end of it, we realized it was time where, so we came out of, out of that meeting primed, you know, to fight. Everybody knew his or her responsibility in the scheme of things. And uh, the, 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 the spirit, the team spirit was exceptional. Right? Yeah, I think Djokovic came with uh, his philosophy um, like um, a winner and always want to work with uh, players who are ready to die for him. Because if you are dying for him, you are dying for the nation. And if you don't die for your coach, your coach will not call you. He start introducing the video analysis and watching the opponent, weak side, and then where they can also hurt you. And that helped us going forward. My first game was uh, against Congo. That was one of the toughest games that uh, we played that year. The, the fans were bullying us, even from the airport to, <laughs> to the stadium. The park was full and packed, and those who were standing outside was even more than those who were inside. It was almost like a war zone. You had, you had to travel with soldiers in the car. We were lucky. The stadium was one of the most intimidating atmospheres I've ever seen. When you hear the shout and they look at you, you are from Ghana. And there was a group of us Ghanaian journalists running commentary and they just kept screaming at us. If we don't beat you, you're not going. It is right for anyone to describe that atmosphere as a war atmosphere because if people come carrying guns, even sticks, it's not easy. Even tear gas is not easy, let alone gun. The intention was to put the fear of God in the team and the players so that they will not be able to play.